All right. Show me the money is back for week number four here on the just end the suffering podcast getting ready to make some NFL picks and joining me for the first time on NFL picks. Now that he is legally allowed to do so the great John Stanko is here. John, how are you? I'm doing great, Mike. Yes, legally, no longer under the umbrella of the corrupt NCAA. It's wonderful. It's wonderful news. Happy to be here. Yeah, it's, this is somebody, John Stanko, somebody I had in mind from year one of the podcast, but he was not legally allowed to do it at his previous job. But now he is free to come on here and do NFL picks all he wants. Yeah, now I'm surrounded by gambling 24-7 at Barstool, so it's nice. Yeah, Again, nice. you bet responsibly, but gambling can be fun if you do it responsibly. Yeah, and just because John is here tonight, we are using the Barstool Sportsbook lines tonight for our picks. I usually do FanDuel, but since John is here, we will support the Barstool brand, do Barstool lines on the picks. I appreciate you doing that. I cannot go against the company, so I appreciate you being flexible, Mike. Hey, I'm always flexible for you, John. Thank you. And as I always do for the new people on this segment, people have not heard from before, you want to let the audience know who you root for in the NFL. Uh, I am a New England Patriots fan, have been since the day I was born. Uh, so it was been a good life for me thus far. We're going through a little bit of a rough patch now, but uh, it's been not a bad life for me. I'd sign for your rough patch after that life, that life you've had. That's true. At least my team can still score offensive touchdowns. Yeah. And when when did you hop on the Patriot bandwagon? Was it pre-Brady? Was it Brady? When was it? Uh, I was rooting for the Patriots pre-Brady. I remember doing so. Um yeah, I remember before Brady, there was a game. I was living in my old house on Kettletown Road, and Adam Benateri missed a kick off the cross off the post, yeah, off the crossbar. And I sat and hid in the closet for 20 minutes, and my parents legit couldn't find me because I was sitting <laughs> in a closet crying because I was so upset he missed the kick. Uh, and then, yeah, and then I remember Brady coming in. I remember where I was for that Rams for that Ram Super Bowl, and every single Patriots Super Bowl, I remember where I'd been. So. I was watching before Brady, but obviously became more honed in once they became a better football program. Um, but yeah, been there since day one. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously you're coming in here this week off a tough loss of the Saints here. And that was one I think you're not going to plan, obviously. So you watched that game closely. What did you take away from the week three game against the Saints? First of all, everyone is saying Mac Jones played bad can just go shut up because it's just not true. Mac Jones's offensive line was awful. The Patriots offensive line was awful. They didn't give Mac Jones any help. Trent Brown being out is, is really bad for the Patriots who already, I mean, they've had a consistently good offensive line, but right now there's just no fluidity to it. Mac Jones threw three picks. Yeah, sure. But only one of them was his fault. The wobbler. One of them went off John Smith's hands directly into the receiver, into the, the, into the defensive back for a pick six, not Mac Jones's fault. Don't know what John Smith was doing with his footwork on that play. And then his hands were just lined with butter. And then this third interception was at the end of the game when Patriots had no chance of winning. He was trying to force something to happen. That's my biggest takeaway from the game, Mike, is that Mac Jones, sure, the offense is not taking shots. I don't think that's Mac Jones's fault because guess what? When you spread it out, give him four or five receivers, he is dicing up defenses with like 20 for 24 when passes are between five to 12 yards or something like that with the short passes. He's super accurate. So Mac Jones is playing fine. The Patriots are not a great football team. They are a C plus football team. Um, but that's my biggest takeaway from the game is that don't blame Mac Jones for loss because he's nothing to do with it. Yeah, I think this year is a strong reminder that the rookie quarterbacks are not the magic cure-alls for, for bad teams. I mean, we see it with yeah. the Jaguars, with the Jets. Justin Fields looked bad for the Bears. Trey Lance hasn't had to do much for the Niners, but just the rookie quarterbacks don't land in good spots, and the guys who are going to be Lamar Jacksons don't come don't grow on trees. Yeah, the, the crazy thing is, is I think uh, I think in Jacksonville, you have Trevor Lawrence being asked to do too much. In Justin Fields, I think he, in his first start, he had the same thing as Mac Jones, where they didn't trust him enough to maybe make big plays or to use what he does best to his advantage. So it, it depends where these quarterbacks go in the situation and the coaches that they have. So I think right now, if you were to give the biggest failing grade to the start of the season for the Patriots, it goes to Josh McDaniels as offensive coordinator, because I don't think the games that he is calling are particularly strong. And I don't think it's suiting the team that he has right now. I think he's still calling plays if he's a little scared. Yeah. I mean, I, I watched week two when the Patriots came into the MetLife and Zach Wilson obviously gave the Patriots that game with all the, all the interceptions there, but Josh Daniels, that game basically is turning Mac Jones to check down Charlie. He's not giving him any chance to make plays. Right. I mean, he, that's the thing. The offense didn't play that great against the Jets. Luckily for the Patriots, the Jets suck. No offense. They're just freaking terrible. So no argument there. Yeah, so it's I listen, I 
I mean, we're going to get into the picks, but I'm sure we'll talk about the game against Tampa Bay coming up. But let's just say I'm not optimistic about it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, when I saw the schedule come out and I saw where the Tom Brady reunion was coming here, so that's when I have to see if Stankle do the picks, and he's here for that. So, obviously, the storyline of the week, probably the season here, is Tom Brady coming back to New England for the first time with the Buccaneers, playing against Belichick and the Patriots. So, what's your take on him coming home as the conquering hero, having won the Super Bowl in Tampa? I hope he kick his ass. That's my honest answer. Yeah. I want to kick his ass and send him back down to Tampa with us with his second straight loss. I I don't I don't like fans of any sport, and I'm particularly annoyed with the Patriots fans because I'm one of them. But those who now are cheering for Brady to succeed at every level in Tampa Bay and to have all the success in the world, I don't I don't like that. I want my team to be better than anyone who's left my team. Like I I want to have success. I never root for the player. I always root for the team. It's just the way I've I've been raised this way. I've always been. So seeing him win last year, it sucked, to be honest. And seeing him throwing touchdown passes to Gronk now sucks even more. So like this season, that them they've been a freaking dynamic duo again. So uh, it's, it's my, one of my biggest pet peeves. It's my biggest pet peeve with the NBA, biggestly with the sport, because they just root for the players. But I, I think it was time for Brady to leave. But it's a lot like a Taylor Swift song. Like, if I can just be honest with you, it's like a Taylor Swift song. And there's a new song, Happiness. There's a line that goes, when a good man hurts you, but you know that you hurt him too. You could break up, but both, pe- both people are at fault. Both people did things wrong, and now you have to reconcile with those circumstances. And right now, somebody's winning that breakup, but in the future, it might be somebody else. Right now, I hope the Patriots can get out of the doldrums of their depression of sitting in bed and yearning over what their ex is currently doing right now, and they finally get out of bed and kick some butt on Sunday. Do I think it's going to happen? No. Do I hope it happens? God, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think you made a good point there because obviously it's like they both have issues here. I mean, the Patriots didn't put the best infrastructure around Tom Brady. Tom Brady said, you know what? I need a chain. I need to go somewhere else. So this all these points where I feel like he's going to get a good reception when he comes back there because obviously he oh, like, yeah. he'll get he the nice standing up. He'll get he, like the Mike Piastri at, at City, at City at Chase Stephen came back to the Mets. He got the standing ovation. They start beating the Mets. They're like, okay, now we hate him again. Yeah, he's going to yeah, he's gonna get a standing ovation. I think if I was there, I would give a polite applause, but I wouldn't do the wooing. I wouldn't stand up. I wouldn't do the massive cheers, but he's going to get a massive ovation. And then he's going to rip the souls out of every single Patriots fan there because God knows how competitive he is. He is going to want to put up another 400-yard game, but this time throwing four touchdowns with it. So I, it's going to be really tough, and it's going to be really painful to watch. I am dreading watching this game, but it's just like it's the slight bit of hope where they can maybe just do something magical and disrupt the whole NFL and create a storyline for the rest of the season. Because, I mean, I as much as NBC is milking this Brady coming back to Foxborough, Mike, imagine, imagine just the entire, the entirety of the NFL coverage if Belichick beats Brady when he comes back to his house with an inferior team, if you will, but the coaching outwits the GOAT in their final, in their eventual reunion. Imagine the NFL coverage for the entirety of the season if that happens on Sunday. I think that's what ESPN, NFL Network, NBC, and everyone's rooting for secretly. Yeah, and I, I'll tell you what NBC's rooting for secretly, too, in this game. I think you had good nail on that storyline. They want fourth quarter, two minutes to go, Patriots up four, Tom Brady with the football, try and try and beat them like in, in, in his own building. NBC yeah, they, they want that, but would they want Mac Jones with the football with two minutes left, a chance to pull a Tom Brady as comeback for his first ever comeback win as an NFL starter? It's also That's interesting. Something too. That's something too. Does he have the Brady magic? Mac Jones, can he turn then he turn back the clocks to 2001 in the Super Bowl when Brady led a comeback drive with nobody expected to take down the team that they thought was indestructible? Maybe something like that happens in week four of the NFL season here in 2021. I don't know. Yeah, I think they also put oh, no, Mike. <laughs> yeah. I also think they put this in the exact right place in the schedule, too, because, I mean, it's not too early. It's, it does, it's not before the baseball playoffs or attention can be diverted here. You have the last big spot here of, like, here is just us before we worry about November sweeps. I think that's the point where you have the Patriots still relevant. You, you said they're not as good a team. You want them falling out of it. This is a good spot to have this game. Yeah, no, it's great. They did they did a phenomenal job scheduling this game. You knew it was going to be prime time. There's there was zero doubt. It was just whether it was going to be Sunday night or Monday night. And now with Sunday night being prime time for the sport, 
you knew it was going to be Sunday night. So the fanfare is going to be there. The coverage is going to be there. Twitter is going to be ablaze the entire game. I cannot wait to stay up far too late and watch the entire thing and have my heart ripped out of me. Yeah, and obviously you want them to win. So let you think. Oh my God. Yeah, I want the Patriots to win so bad. So what is the key here? What do they have to do to win this football game? Because Tom Brady coming in here after a loss is going to be very angry. He, he is going to be angry. I, I think the Patriots have to pass the ball efficiently, and I think Mac Jones does that in the short to intermediate routes well. Um, to, just looking up some stats, the Bucs have allowed opponents uh, to throw for a 72% completion percentage thus far this season uh, on attempts uh, with an average attempt of seven yards per throw. So that is the short routes, which Mac Jones is very good at thus far. And if the Patriots go to some man beating type plays where they trust the receivers to get open in short spurts and Mac Jones is able to dice them up, the Patriots have a chance. And that would also go to the ball control, the possession, which you're going to need because you don't want the ball in Brady's hands because you can't trust, you can't trust their offense not to do well because they have so many weapons. So you want to keep it away from them. It's really hard to run on the Bucs because their defensive line is just so good. So the, you got to be efficient with that short passing attack. You got to get in second, like second and five, second and four situations consistently. Uh, so I think that's really key. And then this is going to be a random one for you, but I think the Patriots got to win the special teams battle because they've looked bad on special teams thus far. They got a punt blocked against New Orleans, which is just uncanny. Uh, Gunner has not done a great job returning punts for the Patriots thus far this year. And But you look at the stats, the Patriots ranked fourth in the NFL in average starting position at the 32-yard line, and the Bucs ranked fifth at the 32-yard line as well, just separated by a couple decimal points. So if the Patriots can win the special teams battle, make the make the Bucs start further back, maybe in their inside their 20, just constantly pinning them deep with Bailey punting it and trying to get to that Pro Bowl caliber again, make them work for those extra yards and those extra scoring opportunities, maybe we'll give ourselves a chance, but... We got to pass efficiently in the short yardage situations and we got to win the special teams battle. That is what I think the Patriots have to do on Sunday night. Yeah, I agree with you there. I think the ball control is the big thing. Like you said, if this is a game where you're, you're trying to go score, score, you're going to lose because they're not the kind of firepower that the Buccaneers do, but you have to play that game. They love to play, which is, you know, the screens, the dump offs, the quick slants, just move the ball, like slowly have those six, seven minute drives. You're getting points and you're keeping Tom Brady sitting on the sideline. Yeah, I mean, it really hurts that we lost James White, who got hurt with a hip injury and is out indefinitely. He got hurt against the Saints, too. That was another big thing from that game. So it, we're, we're, we're down our main receiving back. We have uh, Brandon Bolden backing him up, who's not nearly the same type of playmaker he is. Damian Harris was very quiet against New Orleans. Don't entirely know why. And he's not a receiving type of back. So the Patriots are going to have to generate those short yardage opportunities for Mac Jones to be able to dice up a defense and be accurate. So we're going to see what happens, but the Bucks have a very good defense as well. Their secondary is their weakness, and we have to be able to exploit that in the short term because I also don't trust our offensive line to protect for a long time, so we're not going to have a chance to really throw it deep very often. All right, that's that's all good stuff today. I'll be excited to watch this game Sunday night. Let's get to the picks, which is the reason why you're here. Nick Freda, you met on the Star Wars podcast called Monsanto Star Wars Movie Rankings. He was here for the picks last week. He's not having a good week. He went 0-3. That's not great. You don't want that. Okay. Yeah, that's not good. It is that is not good. So to reset what Nick did last week, I have it up on the screen for people watching the video version here. He had the Bucks getting the point and a half because he did this earlier in the week against the Rams, lost that one. He had the Seahawks laying a point and a half Minnesota, and you know happened in that game. And he took your Patriots laying the three against the Saints, and that went backfired on him. To be fair with you, I had all three of those picks as well with my own picks, so I can't be too upset about them. So I went 0 3 on those specific ones as well. Though they they wouldn't be my mortal locks or anything like that from last week, but I was with them on those picks. Yeah, I had a much better week. I went three and out for the first time this year. Hey, there we go. Good for you. What'd you have? Yeah, three and zero on on the week. I went head to head with him on the Rams Bucks game. I took the Rams laying the points. I got that one easily. I had the Packers getting three and a half in Santa Clara on Sunday night. That one worked out well. And the I had that one as well. gut feel of the week based on how they were playing and the opponent. I took the Bengals getting the four and a half points in Pittsburgh against the Steelers, and they won the game outright. So good, good week for me. The Bengals aren't bad. The Bengals are not a terrible football team. They are not. They are playing much better. And Pittsburgh, Ben looks cooked. So I was like, that's the reason why I went against that pick. Because like, the Bengals at least keep this close, if not win, if not win the game. Yeah, I know. As as much as uh, Bears fans are angry that Andy Dalton might come back and start, I would take Andy Dalton at quarterback over Ben Roethlisberger right now. Yeah, so would I. 
So on the year, Team Challenger is two and seven. All, both wins came from Charlie Borders in week one. So I am four and five. So I'm trying to get back in the right direction here. So slow starts for both sides. All right. Well, let's try and get on the positive side here. All right. All right. We are going to the picks now. John, as the visitor here, you are up first. So where are you going with pick number one? Pick number one, I'm going to go with the Philadelphia Eagles getting seven and a half points against the Kansas City Chiefs. The Chiefs coming off a loss. People are going to think that they're hungry to get back to 500. But I point this out that Kansas City is allowing over five yards per rush, 5.4 to be exact, which is third worst in the NFL. And Philly is rushing about 5.4 yards per attempt in the NFL this season, which is second best. So you want to play ball control against Kansas City. You don't want to let Mahomes get a lot of possessions. So if the Eagles do what they can do well and run the ball, they will have that possession and they can keep this game close. Now the thing is, Philly needs to trust running it because I think they've run it one of the fewest amount of times in the NFL this season. I think it was somewhere around like the 70, 75 mark. Just not a high total for three weeks. But that would be the plan if I was the Eagles. Do that. Kansas City is also 0-3 against the spread this year. So you got to hope that, you know, they keep that trend going. Maybe they go to 0-4. And, and Kansas City ranks dead last in the NFL this year in terms of expected points contributed by a defense, according to NFLreference.com. So a bad defense that's not good against the run, against a team that has run successfully when they have, and a running quarterback as well that can keep possession away from a home. So while I think Kansas City will win this game outright, I do think that the Philadelphia Eagles keep it within 7.5. I love this pick on your on your part too because also as you mentioned, a the Chiefs don't cover. This is a problem like the last year; they've not covered games in a long time. Not since that Jet game last year, they've had, had trouble covering the spread for the last year and a half. And also, that hook is massive in this game because you can get the backdoor cover there, get within seven points. That's a, I love exactly. that. Where yeah, you exactly, I'm right there with you. Where are you going? Pick number two. Uh, pick number two for me, I'm going to go with the Detroit Lions getting two and a half against the Chicago Bears. I think the Detroit Lions win this game outright, so I would take the money line, but give me the two and a half points here. I think this is a tale of two teams that are going against each other with two incredibly opposite uh, dichotomies with head coaches. You have the Chicago Bears, who don't want to play for their head coach, Matt Nagy, who has no idea what he's doing at the quarterback position and nobody believes in him. Versus the Detroit Lions with Dan Campbell, while they're not winning a lot, they're playing hard in these games. They're keeping on fighting. Jared Goff doesn't look terrible. And the Lions got beat bad last week, so they're going to want to bounce back with a division win this week against the Bears, who have the worst scoring offense I've ever think They're terrible. So them and the Jets are just abysmal offensively. They had less than 50 yards last week total, something We're like that. It. Yeah, that, that's just terrible. So the Bears are the second worst scoring offense, and they're allowing oh, almost 50% on third down conversions, which is almost as bad as the Washington Redskins this year. So the Detroit Lions with a good defense themselves going up against a bad offense and a Lions offense with Swift, they'll convert on those third downs. And I think they win this game outright against the lowly Chicago Bears and Matt Nagy's hot seat, hot seat gets even hotter. I love this pick too, because these guys, the Lions have been in all their games this year for at least a good portion of it. They're the big comeback against the Niners in week one, scared you half to death in the knockout pool. They get the Packers a fright in the first half, and they should have won last week. Judge Tucker needs a historic kick to win that game. So yeah. I love that pick. I think the younger went out right. So great job there on that pick. All right. I'm all glad right. We're, we're two for two on agreement here. All right. Pick number three. Where are you going? Pick number three. I am picking a favorite. I'm going with the Green Bay Packers minus six and a half versus Pittsburgh. I think this is just a you look at the quarterbacks here. I think you got Aaron Rodgers, who proved that he is still one of the best in the NFL with the comeback last week against a quarterback that looks like he doesn't want to play anymore and can't throw a ball more than 10 yards down the field and can't shuffle his feet more than a yard in the pocket. Um, so Green Bay has a top 10 pass defense and Pittsburgh can't run the ball for anything. So are they going to have to rely on Big Ben to toss the ball around against a solid secondary? I don't think that's a great way to go. And opponents against Pittsburgh this year are getting over 12 yards per completion. And if you give Aaron Rodgers time to throw the ball deep, he's going to take advantage of it. And Pittsburgh for their... Great defense, theoretically. T no T.J. Watt last week. We'll see about this week. They've only hit the opponent quarterback 13 times this year. So when that ranks 29th in the NFL, so you're telling me Aaron Rodgers is going to be able to get time against a secondary that's allowed big plays? I will take Aaron Rodgers every single time with that. I think Green Bay wins this game by over a touchdown. I would say it's a two-possession win for the Green Bay Packers over the Pittsburgh Steelers. Agree as well. Three for three. As he said, I think is the See, That's not good, though, that we agree on all my picks, Mike. We need to disagree on one because that's just we're, we're putting the skunk on them if we agree on all of them. 
Well, I think that you'll you might disagree with some of mine, so we'll see where we get to there. But I think you said pick against Ben. I think it's a value pick here, and you're again not having to worry about the hook here. You get a touchdown win. Good job. Yep. Yep. All right. I'm up now. My first pick, pick number one. I'm going to take the Saints at home, laying eight and a half against the Giants. Going back to the Superdome, a lot of emotion in there. The crowd's going to be jazzed up. The big win for the Saints against your team last week. And the Giants are a god awful football team. I mean, how they lost Atlanta was last week makes no sense. Joe Judge has no idea what he's doing. They just lost Blake Martinez of the season, probably their best like, defensive player in the front seven outside of Leonard Williams. And the Giants never win down there. You know this. They never win in New Orleans. And I think this game's going to be a blowout with the way the Giants are playing. So give me the Saints laying all those points for pick number one. I, I would agree with this pick. I wouldn't make it a lock. My only worry is that it's over a touchdown. Uh, so I think I think Daniel Jones hasn't played bad in the past couple of weeks. He has not been the reason that the New York Giants have lost. So with that being said, with them losing to the Saints last year, I do think they lose this game. I think you got to hope for a defensive touchdown from the Saints, which is very possible against Daniel Jones' turnover point ability. So I agree with you, but I'm not 100% confident. Put me at like 60% leaning on your side. All right, that's pick number one. Pick number two, I'm going to go to that Sunday night game. I'm going to take the Buccaneers laying the seven against the Patriots here. This is just one. I just, I knew you're not going to like it, but I can't bet against Tom Brady here. Coming off a loss, big motivating factor here. And I don't think, New, as you said, New England's an inferior team. I don't think they're going to be up to the moment here. I think they're going to have a lot of trouble here. It's going to be an angry Tampa Bay team. I think they win this game by double digits. So I'm going to take the Buccaneers laying the seven pick too. I agree with you 100%. I would have made that a mortal lock of mine, but I'm not putting a bet against the Patriots as a mortal lock of mine. So I agree with you 100% here. I think this is a 14-point game, uh, if that, if we're lucky. Yeah, that's pick number two. Pick number three, I'm take, I have to get a dog on the board here. So I'm going to take the Ravens getting a point and a half in Denver against the Broncos. And I think this one here... I saw Denver last week. Denver was good, but again, track record for Denver. They had three teams they had beaten this year. The Giants, the Jaguars, and the Jets are combined 0-9. This is a big step up in weight class here, the Ravens. And the Ravens had the big win in Kansas City. They had the letdown last week in Detroit, and they got bailed out by Justin Tucker. I think they're going to be focused coming in this game. I think they can win this one outright pretty easily. I think they'll make some plays against the Denver defense. I'm, only, I'm getting a point and a half. I think they're going to win this outright. So give me the Ravens getting a point and a half in Denver for my last pick of the week. I disagree with you, sir. I am picking the Denver Broncos. It's time to start believing in the Denver Broncos. Their defense is good. Teddy Bridgewater is salvageable. They have weapons on the outside that are solid. Despite losing Jerry Judy, they're still putting up decent numbers on the outside. And the thing is, they're being creative with their playmaking on the offensive side. I like the, Den the Denver Broncos here. I've been down on the Baltimore since the start of this year because I don't think they are multidimensional on offense. And I think Denver's defense is good enough to take away one of the Ravens' main facets especially if the Ravens wide receivers just don't catch the ball. That'll be very, that's very helpful as well. So I like the Denver Broncos here at home to play well defensively and win a close game. I think it'll be within a field goal, but the spread's not that big. So that's why I like Denver in this one. So I do agree with you on one. All right. So to reset the picks here, Stanko is going with the Eagles getting seven and a half against the Kansas City Chiefs. The Lions getting two and a half against the, against the Bears. He likes them to win outright as well in that game. He'll win the money line. The Packers laying six and a half against the Pittsburgh Steelers. I am laying the eight and a half with the Saints to blow out the Giants at the Superdome. I'm laying the seven with the Buccaneers to win the Tom Brady reunion tour here. And I'm getting the point and a half with the Ravens in Denver. And those are your picks for week number four on the Just End the Suffering podcast. And I want to update the audience here as well. I do the knockout pick every week on the podcast. You win a knockout pool this year, John. Uh, I am. I am still alive as well. I am still alive. So who have you used so far? Oh, I need to remember now. I used San Francisco week one, so I had a scare like you. I used Carolina last week, and I believe I used Cleveland in week two against Houston. So I've used San Francisco, Cleveland, and Carolina. That is also my exact sequence. So we are actually on the same page here for what team we have available to us. So, all right. So who are you picking with week four? Week four. There, I think there are two options on the board here. I think... Option number one, Tennessee against the Jets. Yep. I we'll think option, that one. option number two, the, the one I'm taking, the spread is so big, and I picked against the Texans last week. I'm taking the Buffalo Bills at home, laying 16 and a half points. I mean, that tells you. We saw how dominant they looked against uh, Washington last week. There's no way Davis Mills is going into Buffalo and win that football game. That is the one that I think I'm going to pick once I get – yeah, once I submit my pick, I was leaning Buffalo Bills as my number one option. But agree with you, Tennessee is a number two option if you don't want to take a uh, a big favorite, if uh, if you don't want to take a big team or that early on with Buffalo. But 
I think you got to be safe, still stay alive as people get knocked out in these early weeks. So I agree with you, the Buffalo Bills. That'll be my pick as well. Again, we're agreeing too much, Mike. We're agreeing too much. Yeah, I mean, we were like last week. I figured I'll risk it for the biscuit with Carolina here and just take the chance that like they might be good later. But this is a, that was a week where I saw a couple I was not sure about. So you know, I said they're not losing that game to Davis Mills on short week. So I said I'm going to do that. So I'll just pick against Davis Mills again. I agree with you. Before we go, Mike, I want to ask you what's one game week four you're most excited for? Maybe it's. A little bit off the radar, one we didn't talk about yet, but one game that you think is going to be very entertaining. I like those two NFC West battles, the Rams, 40, Rams, Cardinals, 49ers, Seahawks, especially that second game because Seattle needs to win because they cannot be one and three at the division. You have one team that's going four and up. They lose the Niners, the Niners are three and one. Yeah, I'm with you. I love the NFC West battle between Arizona and, and LA, uh, the Rams, because I think Kyler Murray has been absolutely insane thus far. You hope DeAndre Hopkins is healthy for him this week and the Rams are just coming off a huge win. Can they keep that momentum? Right now, they're the best two teams in the NFC West, the way they played. I think that game is going to be an absolute shootout. I'll, I mean, I'd be scared to bet the over because it's probably going to keep on going up over the course of the week. But I think that game is going to be so fun to watch. Yeah, and next week on the picks here, I'm going to have our legal guy, Phil Frazza, come on the line. Big Giants guy. So we're going to start getting, seeing the anger of the Giant fans growing as the season progresses. I don't know where that win's coming from for them. New York sports right now is abysmal. There's not much to look forward to if you're a New York sport fan right now across any sports, unless, unless you're, you're a Brooklyn Nets fan. Or a Yankee fan right now, because at least you have a good shot going to the playoffs. Yeah, yeah, I'm a Red Sox fan. We don't need to talk about that. Yeah, because, I mean, the football season's over in September again, which is incredible for, for New York. It is, it is. You got to hope for a coach's firing to generate some juices or something to happen. I don't know. But Zach Wilson needs to learn to not throw the ball at the other team. Yeah, and, and the whole team is a mess because, like that, as you mentioned, the Bears' performance being bad offensively, I the Jet game was brutal to watch. I mean, they could do anything in that game, right? Yeah, the thing. I mean, yeah, the thing is, I think with the Bears, it's more of the play calling and everything that was not great. But with the Jets, Zach Wilson just looked bad. He would, there was a lot of highlights of him just missing comeback and out routes, and yeah. he just was not accurate with the football. So. It depends which one is scarier, your quarterback just not being good and not being accurate with correct play calls or a coaching staff that has no idea what to do with a super uber talented quarterback and just putting him in all the bad spots. You got to pick your poison there. The thing is, like, it's a bad team. You know, the mark of the bad football team is they can never, there's like, there's not like one moment where they do anything right, where there's something going wrong every play, whether it's the line not blocking, where the receiver's not getting open, receivers dropping passes, the defense not making stops, the quarterback not completing passes or completing the other team questionable coaching the Jets have it all right now yeah they do but I do think Salah's not a terrible coach in the long haul again the Jets defense is not terrible uh the Jets defense is not terrible just offensively right now they need to have Jesus Christ come down and bless them with some talent because they're lacking everywhere I, I mean they have a the talent they just been putting them on the bench right now for God knows what reason you have Corey did you have talent Corey Davis is he that talented is he that talented I, offensively I, I said like my point was why is Denzel Mims on the bench or throwing Braxton Barry as a former Patriot like like every other pass in the offense? Yeah, I agree with you. Mims, yeah. Mims is solid. Uh, but again, I think Corey Davis is a low-end number two wide receiver or a high-end wide receiver three, maybe. He's not a number one option. He's not. He's I, I'm like the way I looked at it is like your best hope here is that like he becomes like your number two, like an Eric Decker was in 2015, where you have somebody above him who's better. Yeah, no, I would agree with you. I would agree with you. But my football team season's over. Yours, at least you still have a shot here. because You have a way on the board. The schedule's not terrible. No, the schedule's not bad. Once we get past this week, it lightens up a little bit. Again, I think the Patriots will be roughly an 8-9 win team. If we get to nine wins, we'll compete for a playoff spot. Really wish we won against New Orleans. It would have made me feel a lot better. But it's fun to watch the Patriots because we have a young quarterback and we have some talent that is young. So unlike last year where everything was just kind of slammed together like a like a messy clay mache ball and everything was just disgusting the entire season. This year there's actually a plan and we'll see some improvement as the year goes on, even though the record might not show it. There's reason for optimism. Absolutely. John, thanks for all the time. I really appreciate it. Before I let you go, I can view follow social media and keep up with what you're doing over at Stanko stance. You can follow me on Twitter at jstanko 99 or follow me at stankostance.com, movies, sports, all the whole shebang. Yeah, and we'll be talking later this month because we are doing that Dune podcast at the end of the month. That'll be exciting. Oh, I am so excited, Michael. I'm almost done with the book as well, so I'm doing the whole book before the movie, and I'll be able to talk all about it. I'm very excited. I'm nervous. I'm just very excited. Absolutely. And funny, because last year our big Halloween project was the Mandalorian premiere. Now we get Dune. I right, listen, I'm more excited for Dune than the Mandalorian, being straight up with you. Hey, straight Dune, up. Dune looks incredible. I cannot wait for this.
I am so excited. Remember, people going in, I'm telling you this right now, PSA, this Dune is going to be in two parts. This is not the entire Dune book. If you know the Dune story, this is only going to be part one, and he's creating a part two, being Devil's Villeneuve. So this is only part one. Keep that in mind before going in. They're not really promoting that aspect of it, but this is only part one. Absolutely. John, thanks for all the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Mike.